Good morning and happy Mother's Day again. When I last left Perry Hall High School, where I'm a physics teacher back on March 13th, if you would have told me that I would not be allowed back in the building for the next two months and beyond, I'm not sure I would have believed you. If you would have told me that FRBC, the building would be sitting silent and empty for the next nine weeks and beyond, I might have wondered if the rapture had happened. It was inconceivable something like coronavirus would happen and turn our lives so upside down. But here we are, nine weeks later and still not at our building together. I'm grateful for the technology that has allowed us to continue to meet, maintaining our religious freedom to do so. But honestly, I'm getting a little tired of online meetings. I look forward to the day when doing our best to consider the health and safety of all, we can meet again face to face, even if that means I can't wear my slippers like I am right now. The leadership of FRBC continues to look to the Lord for help and direction concerning how we, as a church, proceed through this ordeal, desiring to bring Him glory through all that we do and to maintain the fellowship of the believers that consider FRBC their church home. Today we continue in our series in the letter to the Philippians. This is the fourth message of this series. So I want to start with a quick review of what we have learned so far. In the first week, Norris Gorman introduced the series and reminded us that we are to be ambassadors for the Lord while here on this earth. He told us the overall theme of Philippians is joy and that we should find joy in the fact that God has chosen us to represent him on the earth. In week two, Paul Dumm spoke and he challenged us that we are to be partners in the work of the gospel and the church. It is not always easy, but it is something Paul instructs the Philippians to strive for. Last week, Tom Shetlick spoke and he reminded us that we are to be worthy in our service for the Lord. What we choose to do with our physical bodies while living out our lives on earth should be choices and actions that bring honor to God. Be ambassadors, be partners, be worthy. What will today's be be? Today's message covers Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. If you have your Bibles, please turn there and follow along as we read through these verses together. Given it is Mother's Day, I felt it would be appropriate to ask several mothers from FRBC to share in reading these verses for us today. We met online a few weeks ago, and I had them read through the New King James Version of these verses while I recorded it. Let's listen and read through these verses as they are read. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That 
at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, ladies, for helping me out with this. I cannot express how much I respect and appreciate the testimony of the moms of FRBC, and indeed, all the women of FRBC. Your love for the Lord and desire to serve and honor him have become even more evident to me through this time of the coronavirus. Let me express a hearty thank you from the leadership team of FRBC. We love you as sisters in Christ and greatly re re value your commitment to the Lord and your efforts in the work of his kingdom. Let's now dig into these verses together. What is the very first word we encounter? Therefore. Every good Bible student knows what to ask when we encounter a therefore. Everyone say it. Ask, what is the therefore, therefore? We need to look back to chapter one to see what it is Paul is saying prior to the start of chapter two. What prompted this word therefore? Look at verses 27 to 30 of chapter one. I like the way it reads in the New King James translation, sorry, the New Living Translation. Philippians 1, 27 to 30. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. What is the truth Paul has just expressed, which caused him to write the therefore of chapter 2, verse 1? We read it as, because of this, therefore that. So what is the this? I would suggest there are four things. They are to live worthy of what the gospel has done for them. They should be standing side by side as partners in the fight for the gospel. They should not be intimidated by the enemies they face in this fight. And they should be ready to suffer for Christ's sake, even as Paul has suffered. We heard about the severity of that suffering in last week's message. These, topics, we, these are topics we have already covered in the messages to date in this series. Given these challenging instructions, what does Paul now say should be true of the Philippians in chapter 2? Given these things, therefore, what should they be doing? Paul does not get right to the expectation of what should be true of them and us, but he takes a detour first. What does he say? Therefore, if. Paul is giving difficult instruction. The Philippians and we might think, I don't want to struggle. I don't want to work hard. I don't want to suffer. Like any good teacher and any good coach, Paul pauses and gives a quick pep talk. What does he say in verse one is motivation for what is to follow? Therefore, if. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ. Therefore, if there is any comfort pr provided by love. Therefore, if there is any fellowship in the spirit. Therefore, if. There is any affection. Therefore, if there is any mercy. Tom mentioned last week Paul's multiple use of the word all. It seems Paul likes to use small but big words in this letter. And here he repeats the word any four times. What should motivate us to live as Paul is instructing in this letter? Do these things motivate you? Have you been encouraged in your life as a Christian, even a little bit? 
I know I have. I've been greatly encouraged in my life in Christ, and I trust you have been too. Have you received any comfort from the love of Christ, even a little bit? I know I have. I have been comforted by Christ's love for me throughout my life. Have you enjoyed fellowship with God through the Spirit? I know I have. The Holy Spirit in me has allowed me to enjoy great fellowship with God and other believers. Have you known affection between yourself and the Lord and maybe even with other believers? I know I have. I know and have known real love as a believer. Have you experienced mercy from the Lord and maybe seen it in believers? I know I have. This mercy has saved me and made me new. Do you think Paul could have extended this list of blessings we have in Christ? Yes, of course he could have. Because of all that we have received in Christ, we should be motivated to action, to obedience. Are you motivated to live as God would have you live today as you consider all that he has given you? This is the question Paul wants his audience to consider. Now he continues with, because all these things are true, therefore. What does Paul now say in verse 2? Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Paul feels the need to give one more point of motivation. He says, fulfill my joy. Paul longs for the spiritual, spiritual success of the believers he has ministered to, and the Philippians are no exception. He wants them to know how they choose to respond to his instruction will have an impact on him. He tells them despite the hardships he is experiencing, which we heard about last week, he will have complete joy if his ministry to them results in the kind of living he's, he is teaching them about in this letter. Given the instructions of chapter 1 to be partners and to be worthy, to be ready to suffer for the sake of the gospel, and having given them his pep talk, Paul, Paul now finally gets to what the therefore is there for. He tells them how to successfully do what he has instructed them to do so far in this letter. What does he say? Therefore, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. What action is Paul exhorting them and us to in this verse? What are the key words? Like-minded, same, one, and one again. Be unified. Here is our B word for today. What does Paul ask of them? Be unified in thought. Be unified in love. Be unified in spirit. Be unified in purpose. Here, Paul is summarizing his instructions from chapter 1 in this one therefore instruction. Be partners working together with the same purpose to live worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Has this instruction changed for the church today? No, of course not. How often does scripture exhort believers unto unity within the church? Images of one body working together or one building being constructed are common in the New Testament for the church. Sadly, the universal Christian denomination has become anything but unified. Satan has been hard at work through the centuries, fragmenting the Christian church, splitting us apart. For our part, we can work to be unified in our ministry at FRBC as individuals and seeking opportunity to encourage unity among other gospel-believing churches that may be different than us in some ways, but the same as us in the ways that are most important. I believe FRBC has matured in this area as a congregation. We have many individuals in our congregation who do not see eye to eye on every nuance of scripture, but we do agree wholeheartedly on the essentials and enjoy great fellowship with and love for each other. We agree on the ennies of verse one and allow them to motivate us unto the unity called for in verse two. In verses 3 and 4, Paul now turns his attention 
to instruction on how to successfully achieve the unity called for in verse 2. What does he say in verse 3? Again, reading from the New Living Translation. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Paul starts with a negative. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. To be correctly engaged in church life, we need to be seeking the benefit of others before ourselves. What is our motivation in going to and participating in church? Is it to get something for our own benefit? Maybe title or prestige, recognition or reward? Is it to make ourselves look good in the eyes of others? These are the wrong motivations. Being selfish does not help to stimulate unity. Seeking your own interest and exaltation does not motivate others to want to work with and fellowship with you. Paul then turns to the positive. This is really the key ingredient to unity in the body. He says, be humble. This also could have been our B word for today. When we think of others as better than ourselves and treat them with the dignity and respect they deserve, putting aside our own pride, it yields the fruit of unity. This must be true of everyone in the, co in the congregation. Title does not make one person better than another, and is not something that should be sought out for the sake of getting a title for ourselves. In fact, having a title, a position of leadership, makes it even more critical to put others first. True leadership in the church comes by humility and service. The danger of being in leadership is that it can lead to pride and self-centered thinking, which works to fracture unity and diminish the quality of our church fellowship. I found a few quotes that support the idea of humble leadership. The first is from C.S. Lewis. He said, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. The second I really enjoy because it is succinct and clear. It comes from Michael de Montaigne. He said this, on the highest throne in the world, we still sit only on our own bottom. We are all human and subject to God as ruler of all that is. We need to have a right perspective of ourselves and seek to be humble no matter our earthly status. Paul continues his instruction in verse four, and here he says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Notice Paul does not say, don't look out for your own interests, but rather, don't look out only for your own interests. God expects us to take care of ourselves, to seek to have our basic needs for food, shelter, and clothing, and the like met. But our basic needs for, sorry, but our intent, excuse me, but our attention should go far beyond that. I like this quote by Rick Warren. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. It is so easy to get focused on our own needs and wants. We can lose sight of desperate needs of others right in front of us. We need to take an interest in the people God puts in our lives so we can know when they have needs that we can meet. We should be looking for those opportunities to humbly serve others. We can always do a better job of this. We at FRBC can do a better job of this. One benefit of the coronavirus is that it has caused more communication between more people than we probably have ever had at FRBC as we have tried to check in on each other and make sure everyone's needs are taken care of. It has been a blessing to talk to many of you on the phone and to get to know you a little better. I trust when this virus is behind us, we will continue to do a better job of taking an interest in others. Let me read verses three and four one more time in the New King James Version. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. 
Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Do you know anyone who does this well? Let me give you a hint concerning who I thought of. What if we read these verses this way? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than herself. Let each of you look out not only for her own interests, but also for the interest of others. One reason I wanted to preach this on this particular section of verses is because I knew today would be Mother's Day. And as soon as I read verses three and four, I thought of many mothers I know who live out these verses. No mom is perfect. And there are moms who are or have been failing miserably as a parent. That does not mean we should not acknowledge those who honor God in their role as moms. Every day I am privileged to witness the kind of selfless service Paul is discussing here as I observe and benefit from the work of my wife Beth in our home. I have witnessed it in the life of Lois, my mom, and Jody, my mother-in-law, and many other mothers I have interacted with through my life at Fort Joy Bible Chapel. I believe the wisest husbands and fathers recognize the leadership role their wives have in their home and encourage their management of the home. He should recognize her critical role and talents, agreeing with and supporting her decisions concerning the daily life of the home. Given this responsibility, the best moms I know don't lord it over their homes, but rather humble themselves and, and serve those God has entrusted to them. It does not mean they deny their own needs, but as they meet their own needs, they are constantly looking for ways to meet the needs of those in their family. Certainly everyone can serve in this way, but given that it is Mother's Day, I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge the many examples we have among us of the kind of living Paul is describing here that we have in our Christian mothers. Let's move on to verses five to eight. Paul now turns to the ultimate motivation for this kind of humble living that will lead to unity in the church. What does he say? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Paul exhorts the Philippians and us to strive for Christ's likeness. We need to think like Jesus thought. Well, how is that possible? How did Jesus think? Thankfully, Paul goes on to tell us. Jesus is God, but he did not hold on to that title, claiming the privileges he could have rightfully claimed when he came here to earth. He let go of his rights in order to become like us. He did not use his position as God to his advantage in his interaction with humanity. Jesus came not only to save, but also to understand us. He wanted to learn what it was like to be human so he could better minister to us. How awesome is that kind of humble leadership? Now, like you, or <laughs> like me, you may be asking the question, how is it possible Jesus as God could learn anything? Now, I don't fully understand this concept myself, but we are told it is true. Hebrews 5.8 tells us, Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. I want to take a moment and consider the things Jesus learned as a human being. We know he went through all that we go through as human beings, including temptation to sin that we experience when life's trials come our way. Hebrews 2.17 tells us this, Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
What are some of the human things Jesus experienced and learned from? Here is a list with references. These verses tell us he experienced want, need, hunger, thirst, ridicule, abuse, humiliation, disappointment, frustration, anger, weariness, rejection, sadness, loss, and severe attack and temptation from Satan. He was tempted to be bitter, to covet, to be angry with his circumstances, to doubt, to be angry with God the Father, to be prideful, self-reliant, and to worship false gods. He was tempted to hate, to take revenge, to complain, to lose faith, to give up, and to doubt the goodness and wisdom of God the Father. This is an impressive but incomplete list. The Bible acknowledges it does not give us much of what Jesus did and experienced during his lifetime. I believe Jesus experienced every possible human emotion and temptation to the extreme. I want to repeat that. Jesus experienced every possible human emotion and temptation to the extreme. No one can say Jesus does not understand what they are going through because he experienced it all. We are not told all that he went through. We do know Satan came back to him after the 40 days of temptation, seeking to make him fail with more temptation. I believe Jesus was tempted with addiction, lust, greed, dishonesty, every possible thing we can be tempted with, because that is what Hebrews tells us. Why is this important? Again, given that it's Mother's Day, isn't one of the great things moms do for us is to be there for us? Isn't there great comfort when mom says to us, I understand, I'm here for you. We appreciate it when someone who has similar experience to us comes to comfort us with shared experience. We appreciate someone who understands our difficulties and trials. The fact is, no one can really understand what we go through. No one that is, except Jesus. What a blessing to know my Lord and Savior truly does understand my trials and temptations and is ready to help me through them all. Now let's go back to our verse from Philippians. Remember, Paul is exhorting us unto unity, and he says this is accomplished through humility. Then he tells us what humility should look like and gives us Jesus as the perfect example of it. Being humble does not come natural to us. It can be hard to do. But if Jesus can do it, we should be able to as well. How far did Jesus go in experiencing humility and humiliation? He gave up his rights as God, putting aside any fame that was rightfully his. Put off his heavenly form and became like one of the creatures he created. He did not come as a great man, but instead took on the role of a bondservant to us. He gave up all claims to his own rights and freedoms and fully committed himself as a servant of humanity. He humbled himself further by allowing himself to experience everything that came from the failure of humanity, the very thing that came from the failure of humanity, death. But more than that, he allowed himself to experience the worst possible death, the death of a cross. Paul is saying in these verses that Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. No other being has gone from the extreme of heaven's throne room to a death on a human cross except Jesus. He knows more than anyone else what it is to be humble and what it is to be humiliated. The cross was designed to scare people away from wrongdoing. Not only, not only was it designed for ultimate physical pain, but it was designed for humili humiliation, to humiliate the crucified. Strip naked, spread out for all to see, your flesh nailed to two beams of wood, left, left low enough so passersby could not only hurl insults at you, but spit on you. For Jesus, it went even further for 
He was condemned to this fate while being completely innocent. How humiliating is that? There are many movies concerning this theme of the humiliation of the innocent, wrongfully condemned. We are disturbed at the thought of the injustice done when an innocent person is condemned. This is what Jesus experienced for us. There's an interesting verse in Romans 6, verse 9 that says this. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never again to die, is never to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. How is it that death has mastery over Jesus? Did Jesus experience the human reality of the fear of death? Yes, he fully experienced that. Death was allowed to have mastery over him as he died for us. Praise the Lord, he was able to defeat death, so that now he is the master of death, and he has the keys of death and hell. There is nothing we can experience, not even death, he has not also experienced. How comforting is that? What is Paul's point in speaking about the humiliation of Jesus in our section? His goal is to exhort us unto humility so we can be fully unified. We need, to, we need to do everything we can to express our love and concern for each other, putting others' interests before our own. We need, to be, we need to seek to be living with compassion and understanding for each other. This will bring about the unity God desires for his church. Of course, Paul is not done. He is striving with everything he can muster to exhort the Philippians under the unity he expressed in verse 2. We arrive now at a crescendo in this section. What is the result of all the humiliation of Jesus? His exaltation. What do verses 9 to 11 tell us? Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here is another therefore. So, what is the therefore therefore? Because Jesus humbled himself, as, was, as we have already discussed, God took action to honor him. The obedience of Jesus pleases the Father. And so, like any good father would, he rewards the son. As the first and best son of God, he received the highest and best rewards. God raised him from the dead, raised him to the highest seat in heaven, gave him a name that is now higher than any other name that exists. And the father will, ju will justifiably insist on the worship of Jesus that will happen when every being that exists will bow and worship him because of who he is and what he has done. Why does Paul end up here? Remember, he's giving a pep talk unto unity. He is giving Jesus as the ultimate example of humility, but also as the example of the result of humble living, exaltation. Why in Paul's instruction unto unity through humility does he end up writing about the exaltation of Jesus? Just as we should humble ourselves in the same way Jesus humbled himself, we can expect reward for that kind of obedient living, just as Jesus was rewarded. It's almost too good to be true. Paul does not say it here explicitly, but it is validated in James 4.10, which says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Is that motivation enough? When we choose to humbly serve God together, we are setting ourselves up for a future exaltation like that of Jesus. Revelation 2.17 says this, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. And in Revelation 3.12 we read, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. 
I will write on him the name of my God and the name of, my, of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. These verses tell us we too will be given a unique, special name by God. In fact, the verse I just read says, I will write on him my new name. How gracious is our Savior? We will be fully identified as belonging to the Father and Jesus for all eternity, having their names written on us. His own special name, Jesus, we read about in Philippians chapter 2, will be written on us. I can't, can't quite get my right mind around the magnitude of the blessing promised to us here. How is it that I will be rewarded with this name that's above all names? How is it that that name will be associated with me? If that is not enough, in Ephesians 2.6, we are told we will be seated with Christ on his exalted throne. We are told in scripture that in eternity, we will rule with Christ, feast with Christ, fellowship with him forever in heaven. How great a motivation is that for choosing humility in this life, for the sake of unity in the church? Just as Jesus receives the ultimate exaltation because of his ultimate obedience, so the level of our reward will be measured out to us based on the level of our obedience. Finally, in verse 11, we are told the ultimate purpose of all of this. What does it say? To the glory of God the Father. This was Jesus' motivation, and it should be ours too. We read in Romans 5, 2, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We should be striving to live in obedience to God, working for his kingdom, and growing in the unity of the church by humbling ourselves to the service he has assigned us to with a goal in view of his glory. This should be our ultimate goal, to live in such a way that we give God the glory he deserves. In eternity, all this will come to fulfillment as we will all be completely unified together, glorifying the Father in all that we do. How beautiful is the scene in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to, 9 to 13. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the th throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white ro robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and all the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped, and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. I long for that day when all sin will cease, all pride will be done away with, and every creature that exists will come together in perfect unity to do what we are designed to do, worship God together. We will be unified someday in eternity, but Paul's challenge to us in Philippians 2, 1 to 11, is that we might strive for unity in our church by humbly serving each other here and now. My challenge to you all, if you consider Jesus Christ as your personal savior, and as you function as a member of God's church, to be humble, to be unified, to God's glory. Again, happy Mother's Day. Thank you for choosing to meet with us on this, in this way today. We'll finish with a song, and then Joel will return to close out the meeting for us. <laughs>